Magic the Gathering. In an age when geek culture had gone mainstream, it still remained one of the more hidden corners left unexplored. Video games and comic books may suddenly become chic. Science fiction and fantasy might finally start winning mainstream awards. But in the store's basements or back rooms, where rickety tables and folding chairs have been assembled, it remains the place where the mainstream is still hesitant to tread. Complex board games with a hundred cardboard squares, character sheets, and oddly shaped dice. And card games. This is not to say that magic has been hiding all this time, that people might not be familiar with it in passing, and that current efforts might propel it across the hurdle into the mainstream consciousness. But if so, it would be the culmination of a long and arduous journey from a basement to another multiverse, a history so expansive that to present it in so simplified a manner is to minimize the effort taken in that time to escape the fringes, to be more than just a recognizable name, and to have people tell you who they like and what color of magic fits them. If you're curious to know what happened to bring us to this point where that might finally happen, then join me as we take a journey all the way back to the Age of Antiquity. If you were to ask the average player of the game what is the traditional story of magic's origin, it would be this. Richard Garfield walks into the offices of Wizards of the Coast trying to sell them a board game that he invented. They ask for a card game instead. He uses his math degree to conceive of magic, and presto, appropriately, this game is called into existence and explodes in popularity. It wasn't quite like that, to say the least. For starters, Wizards of the Coast didn't have an office. It had Peter Atkinson's basement. And far more often, it had Atkinson's desk at Boeing, where he worked as a systems analyst for the aerospace giant, putting in late nights trying to get his company off the ground to start producing games. Atkinson's real passion. Atkinson had a degree in computer science, so back in 1990, when he launched Wizards of the Coast, he would take to the version of the internet that was out there that was called Usenet, a kind of primitive sort of forum where people could gather to discuss topics and channels from the serious to the fun to the actual pornographic. And it was here, in rec.games.board.design, that Atkinson's mention of his move into game publishing got the attention of none other than Mike Davis. You probably never have heard of him, even if you are into magic, but it's a virtual certainty that if not for him, the game wouldn't exist. Davis was a math student at the University of Pennsylvania C, and he was really excited about a game that he had co-designed called Robo Rally. It was a board game where you guided out-of-control robots through obstacles, and Davis was quite proud of it and thought it had real potential. He and his partner had sold it to FASA, but after sitting on it for two years, they finally returned it, unpublished. Davis was hoping Wizards of the Coast might be interested in it. Well, Adkinson wasn't, or rather, couldn't. A board game like that would be way beyond what a little startup could afford to try out. There's too much physical material required for it. Adkinson played the game and liked it, but rather than buying it, asked if Davis and his partner could meet with him in Portland to discuss it. The name of his partner was Richard Garfield, currently focused upon the distribution of the binomial coefficients modulo P, his doctoral thesis. Richard Garfield immediately impressed Atkinson with a love of games, perhaps even beyond that of a man whose passion had led him to start his own game company. But Garfield had been making up games his entire life, intricate games, not just little horsing around like all children did with rules and pieces and cards and more. As a teen, he'd been intrigued at the idea of a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Garfield didn't know what the game was or how to play it. He only heard about the game from others, had tantalizing hints about what it could do, and it inspired him to create his own version of the game. It had little in common with the version that Gygax created, and when he finally did find it, he actually found it kind of confusing. 
but interesting and more to the point, inspiring. And it's how he came up with the game Five Magics. The original idea evolved rather simply. Everyone has heard of black magic, and thus white magic is its good guy counterpart. Then there's nature magic, and there's also magic around the elemental forces, one hot and solid, the other cool and fluid. Thus the five schools of magic in terms of color. White for light and life magic, black for death and destruction magic, green for magic related to the natural world, red for fire and rock, and blue for the sea and the air. Creatures were associated with the colors, white getting an angel, black a demon, red a dragon, you get the idea. The colors were arranged in a circle so that they were in opposition, white and black opposing because of light and dark, red and blue opposing because of fire and water. Green didn't quite fit into that, so it was placed between white and red, since it would be opposed to death and destruction as well, thus giving black two enemy schools. But this worked well. Red would oppose white as well as blue. Blue would oppose green as well as red, and so on. This created the idea of allied colors, the ones next to you, and enemy colors, the ones opposite you. And the enemy of my enemy actually is my friend, in this case. Five Magics was constantly evolving, though, and just one of many things he had created even by the time he was working on his doctorate. So when, at the meeting, Adkinson explained why he couldn't publish Robo Rally, Garfield got straight to the point. Tell me what you're looking for, then. Give me the design parameters, the goals. What is it that you want? And that's the game I'll make for you. So Adkinson said, well, he noticed that at RPG tournaments, a lot of times the players were left with nothing to do. They were waiting between games, or for someone who was late, or for their ride. These were gamers with time to kill, so something they could easily pull out and play in those situations. Something like a card game that would be easy to bring with you, and that could showcase fantasy art like they saw at conventions. Not necessarily that elaborate, but something cool and exciting. The following weekend, at Dragonflight, a convention in Seattle, Garfield demonstrated Robo Rally to people at Adkinson's behest, who then started introducing Garfield to people, showing him the world of gaming, or at least their little corner of it. Afterwards, while the two of them were alone and chilling after the tiring day, Garfield told Adkinson he had an idea. He then explained the card game he'd conceived based on Adkinson's description, but then said politely that he wasn't sure if such a game could actually be designed. It was rather radical, but he thought it could work. He'd try to, anyway. Little did he know that after he was gone and Adkinson told the idea to his business partner, the two were literally dancing in the parking lot as they thought about the possibilities of this. Using five magics to help him out, Garfield worked to figure out how to make the modular style of the game work and returned to Adkinson with a deck of 120 cards, the alpha version, to start out and explain it. He began testing it out with his friend, Barry Reich, interested in seeing how the first playthrough might go. What was shocking was how quick it was. A long game took 15 minutes, and typically it was closer to 10 or even 5 incredibly short for experienced board gamers, but it was still exciting. The two lost track of time and played all night, stumbling out at 8.30 the next morning, exhausted but confident Garfield was on the right track. Next drafted into the project was Scaff Elias, a fellow math student. Intrigued, Elias sacrificed some of his comic books to help mock up better cards for playtesting, producing the beta version. They simulated the production of cards at three rarities, common, uncommon, and rare, produced appropriate quantities, mixed them up, and shared them with their guinea pigs. Excitement took over, not only with the game, but the larger game, the way players would start trading with each other to get the cards they wanted, to the point where it seemed like its own economy. By the spring of 1992, they had developed the Gamma set and were really refining how it all worked and every day the data suggested it was going to be a bigger hit than they thought. They had no idea the grim situation in Washington. 
Wizards of the Coast had completed four years of work developing the Primal Order. What was unique about it wasn't that it was an RPG, but rather an RPG supplement. It was designed to serve as a supplement to any RPG a Game Master might want to use, thanks to what they called the cap system. But the worst case scenario happened. Palladium, creators of the popular Rifts, felt that this infringed on their IP and sued. This is no surprise in retrospect, as Palladium is noted for sending cease and desist letters to fans for releasing free conversions for their games, but it impacted the struggling Wizards of the Coast hard. And during that, they were sitting on their beta copy of Magic the Gathering, as the game was being called. Magic wasn't something that could be trademarked, so they considered Mana Clash, but in the end it was felt adding The Gathering would be sufficient. They were certain Magic the Gathering was the answer to all of their problems if they could just find a way to make it. To protect it, Adkinson created Garfield Games, owned by Wizards and Garfield himself, to own Magic. This would allow Adkinson to bring on investors for Magic without exposing them to any of the risk that the Palladium case presented. Even after a settlement was reached, things still weren't easy. Adkinson continued to work at Boeing to make ends meet, and then to use their computers after hours. During this time, like something out of a movie, Marilyn the janitor approached Adkinson with a check. It was her family's life savings, just a thousand plus dollars. But she said she saw just how hard Adkinson was working, and she wanted to invest in his company, convinced that it would make her a bundle. Adkinson had mixed feelings about letting Marilyn invest everything in the business when he saw the trouble it was in, but they needed the funds to get it off the ground. They knew that Magic was like a high-performance sports car with a dead battery. If they could just get enough cash to jumpstart it, it was going to be unstoppable. Adkinson took out a second mortgage on his house to get the money to produce Magic. He believed in this. He believed that it could work. He wasn't trying to screw anyone out of their money. He was just concerned that he was now extending that risk to someone else. But nevertheless, Marilyn became an early investor in Wizards of the Coast. In addition to the financial barriers, there was the production one. Wizards of the Coast made game books, not game cards. Their contacts were in all of the wrong industries. There were two groups that printed cards. Those that made them collectible, like Fleer, and those who made them for games, like Bicycle. But there was nobody making a playable, collectible game. You couldn't play the game with baseball card stock, but it wouldn't look attractive on playing card stock. The answer would come thanks to White Wolf, Mark Ryan Hagen to be exact, the former boss of Lisa Stevens, who was now Wizards VP. Ryan Hagen discovered a representative from Cardamundi, a printer in Belgium who could pull off exactly the right balance of stock to meet Wizards' needs. The only problem was the randomization. They had no idea how to do that. I mean, you'd need some kind of a mathematical genius to be able to sort that out, they said. For once, a problem was right in the team's wheelhouse. They gave the game a test run at Origin, which in any good story should be the moment you find out all the hard work had paid off. So I guess this isn't a good story. The consensus was that Magic the Gathering sucked. They didn't have things properly prepared, and so people were given unplayable decks to try out. The fallout from the convention was that Wizards had once again shot themselves in the foot. To try to save the game, his company, and his house, they needed a good showing at Gen Con. So to prepare, Adkinson rented a van, tossed in all the product that he had, and spent the next two weeks traveling from one store to the next to show them magic in person, to help them get it. Some were duds, some were successes, but the successes were real successes. Word of mouth was spreading, buzz was growing. By the time he reached Albuquerque, people were so excited he was greeted like a celebrity. Everyone curious about the game they'd been hearing so much about. He arrived at Gen Con, and that's when their hard work once again crashed headlong into their bad luck. The shipment of cards that they were going to be showing and selling 
weren't here. The cards had come from Belgium, remember. They passed through customs and were currently being held up. Adkinson was watching as what he had predicted. Players playing magic between the events at the massive gaming convention played out right before his eyes using the little product from stores that he'd had or sold out of the back of his van. But he couldn't sell any product to the rest of the customers who were interested in this new game. The cases finally were passed through customs and airshipped to Milwaukee, quickly unpacked and sold to the crowds interested in seeing what all the hype was about firsthand. What exactly was Magic the Gathering? The concept of the game being sold at Gen Con was simple enough. Two wizards engage in a magical duel. The cards are the tools they use to carry it out in separate decks. Your deck was full of spells to attack the opponent or to protect yourself from them, divided into sorceries, instants, interrupts, enchantments, summons, and artifacts. Sorceries, instants, and interrupts were all the same kind of thing, just varied on their timing of when you could play them. You used them once and then placed them in the discard pile, which was called the graveyard. Enchantments, summons, and artifacts all worked on the same timing as sorceries, except they hung around. Enchantments being a spell with an ongoing effect upon the game. Artifacts being items of power that could affect the game in different ways. And summons that called your creatures to fight and protect you. Obviously, some cards would be more powerful than others, so a means was needed to keep that in check. Otherwise, whoever brought in the most powerful card would always win, and there'd be no strategy to it. To control this, spells were given a power cost called mana, which could most commonly be provided by lands, although, as we'll soon see, that was by no means without exception. To provide the game with a tempo, players were only allowed to play, not cast because lands are not spells, to play only one land per turn, thus forcing players to consider cheap spells as well as expensive ones, or else they might lose before they get the chance to use their powerful spells. Now, as I said, mana was usually, but not always, provided by lands. Lanoir elves, for instance, were summoned creatures that could make one green mana a turn although they couldn't do anything else. Birds of Paradise went one better, for although it had a power of zero, the elves at least had one, it could make one mana of any color. It hadn't been intended for the game. It was because the art for Tropical Island made the bird in the picture far too prominent. So new art was made for Tropical Island, and the bird was given its own place, going on to become a staple of multicolor green decks. But there were six notable cards in the game that produced mana besides lands, all artifacts. Five of them all had a cost of zero, tapped for one mana of a specific color, and all had mox in the name, derived from the slang word moxie. That was all that they did. They were, really, no different than a land. Drops into play for nothing, only during your turn, only taps for one mana. Sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? Plus, artifacts are a lot easier to destroy than lands, and, as a spell, it can be countered. But what distinguished them was that they were like lands in just about every way except for the most important one of all. They weren't bound to the one-per-turn rule. You could play as many as you want, even if you already played a land that turn, and you could use that mana immediately. That one little distinction made a massive world of difference. The sixth artifact was called the Black Lotus, also with a cost of zero, but this produced three mana at the cost of being a one-time thing. Maybe short-sighted, but if a deck used 20 Black Lotuses instead of lands, it could kill an opponent before they even had their first turn. So, as you can see, the dull ability to generate mana more quickly soon proved to be absolutely devastating. This also ran into severely undercosted cards, such as Time Walk, which permitted the player to take another turn after this one finished. It joined with Black Lotus and the Cycle of the Five Moxes. Uh, cycle is what it's called when something similar or identical is done in all colors. For another example, let's look at the Boons. 
A boon is a special blessing. So each color received one related to what it did and in a ratio of three to one. That is, it cost one mana of its color and did something in threes. Red got Lightning Bolt, which does three damage. Green got Giant Growth, which gave a creature three power and three toughness. Black got three black mana, thanks to Dark Ritual. And White's Healing Salve could gain three life or prevent three damage. But Blue received Ancestral Recall which let the player draw three cards or force the opponent to draw three cards. Why would you want them to do that? More on that later. Garfield was convinced by the team that this last one was extremely powerful, but the decision was made to do to it what had been done with the Moxes, Black Lotus, and Time Walk. Print it at rare. That way it won't see much play. Also at rare was Time Twister, which shuffled your hand graveyard, and deck called the library together, and then drew seven cards just like at the start of the game. To be fair, your opponent got to do the same thing, but one thing learned early on was that just because the same thing happened to both sides didn't mean something was fair. You could cast most or all of your hand, then cast Time Twister, and you're back to a full hand again, but your opponent might have already had a full hand. Much like how only one land could enter play during your turn, only one card was drawn during your turn, naturally anyway. Obviously, if you play a land and cast a spell, you're losing two cards but only gaining one, and probably more if you were using Moxes or Black Lotus. Thus, players would all too soon start to run out of cards in their hands, which meant they ran out of options on what to do to either defeat their opponent or thwart being defeated themselves. So another seemingly boring thing, drawing more cards, was powerful because it broke the rules that gated progress. As a result, the Moxes, Black Lotus, Time Walk, Ancestral Recall, and Time Twister became known as the Power Nine. Despite all appearances, these nine cards were the most powerful in the game, even though they didn't seem to be doing anything special. Draw cards? Get mana? Aren't you doing that already? It was doing it faster than your opponent that made all the difference. Giving players either free costs, free mana, or more cards to be able to play would be responsible for many of the overpowered cards throughout Magic's long history. What led to this becoming an issue was the kind of problem that you want to have. The game succeeded beyond all expectations. The assumption was that this would be a game played among friends who would buy a starter and a few packs, make a deck, and only see cards within their area, or occasionally with players at conventions. This was 1993. Our interconnected world was only just starting to come into existence. A rare card meant you'd probably never see more than one ever. Elias had demonstrated the power of the Moxes during testing, impressing everyone with just how potent he could make his deck with an artifact basis. But they had all been confident that his deck was an aberration. Nobody was going to buy enough cards to likely get a Mox, never mind ten like Elias was using. Garfield wanted cards to surprise people, that a player would encounter a deck with a card they'd never seen before. The entire design of the game was premised on people dabbling with the game, and the rarity system would also be the stopgap measure that kept power cards in check. But what had been expected as a starter, maybe two, and possibly a booster? Well, at Gen Con, players bought a starter, then came back later and bought a booster. Then they came back and bought entire boxes of boosters. These were not the kind of quantities the game had been designed for. This was the stuff of madness. And instead of being surprised at what was out there by a lack of communication, complete lists of cards were taking over rec.games.board, to the point some were hoping a special magic subsection could be created to stop drowning out discussions of other games while everyone was talking about Magic the Gathering. So no, buying a tiny bit of magic 
wasn't what happened. Instead, players gobbled up packs as fast as they could make them. The initial printing of 2.6 million cards was released in late August and sold out by late September. A second print run was made, this time 7.8 million, which corrected errors from the original printing as well as restoring two missing cards, Volcanic Island and Circle of Protection Black. In addition, the five lands for each color, Plains for White, Island for Blue, Swamp for Black, Mountain for Red, Forest for Green, have been printed with two different works of art, but this was increased to three so that they could truthfully say the set had over 300 cards in it. This set came out in mid-October, and by mid-December, it too had sold out. These two runs of what was referred to as the limited edition were distinguished from each other by the corners of the cards. Modifications to the printing mechanism caused the distinctive differences, and so the first was referred to as Alpha, and the second, Beta. But knowing they had a hit on their hands, the demand was immediately made for more cards. The next stage of the plan was supposed to be Ice Age, specifically Magic Ice Age, instead of The Gathering. I'll get into that more later on. But at this particular moment, it wasn't ready. And to make things worse, the intention was to include reprints of some of the commons, something fans wouldn't appreciate so soon. Adkinson, Garfield, and numerous Wizards of the Coast personnel flew out to Philadelphia to meet with the original playtesting team, now called the East Coast Playtesters, to try to come up with a solution. More cards were needed, and pronto, because if too much time passed, interest in it could wane. Ice Age was thus pushed aside to allow for some new, small expansion to fill the gap. Garfield was inspired to fill that gap thanks to Neil Gaiman, specifically issue number 50 of the comic book Sandman. He decided the next set would be based upon 1001 Arabian Nights and adapted some of the elements to the game. This was somewhat new territory. While suggestions had been made in playtesting to flesh out the cards in limited a bit so that they had names like Sarah Angel instead of just Angel, or Shivan Dragon, or Sanger Vampire, you know, to give them a sense of flavor. But drawing on Arabian Nights gave the set a unified flavor sense. To help ensure that players wouldn't have to play with the new cards that they didn't want to, Garfield also planned for the brown backside to be a kind of a purplish-pink color. That went over very badly. Word of it got out and calls poured in from people desperate to get wizards to change their mind, that it would ruin the point of integrating cards into their existing decks or trying out new ideas. Horrified, and with the masters already sent to Belgium with the new card backs, Stevens called an emergency meeting on Sunday, and finally the last holdout, Garfield himself, was convinced that it was a bad idea. Instead of an altered card back, they copied a picture of a scimitar, faxed it to Belgium, and instructed that it be put on the front of every card, thus creating what would be known as the expansion symbol, the graphic that distinguishes all card sets from each other to this day. Besides the new flavor, Garfield added something new. Lands that didn't just tap for mana, or necessarily tap for mana at all. Elephant Graveyard, for example, could be used to regenerate elephants and mammoths. Desert could do a point of damage to an attacking creature. Drawbacks were added, like City of Brass that could tap for any color of mana, but did a point of damage to you each time. And Card Draw, like Bazaar of Baghdad, which allowed you to draw two cards, but then you had to discard three cards. But most impressive of all was Library of Alexandria which allowed you to draw a card, but only if you had seven cards in your hand. That sounds unimpressive, since your hand is already full. Any more, and you have to discard down to seven at the end of your turn. But it's a card whose power is revealed once you've used it. Just like Bazaar of Baghdad, which sounds terrible. Get fewer cards than I started with? Is that a misprint? But it's much more powerful than it seems. The set also contained notable new creatures, such as Ernum Jin and Curdape, 
that would become staples of their time. And Juzam Jin, a champion 5-5 creature for only 4 mana. Between Moxes, Black Lotus, and Dark Ritual, a turn 1 Juzam Jin was a definite possibility. And just in case the cards were a problem, Garfield included a card that would get rid of all the Arabian Nights cards if necessary. And in honor of Neil Gaiman for the inspiration, called it City in a Bottle, after what was seen to happen to the city in the comic book. This would be the first of three so-called expansion hosing cards. The third would appear in Homelands years later. But as for the second one, well, we'll get to that soon. Arabian Nights hit just as Beta was finished being devoured, in late December. By late January, it too was gone. During the meeting to discuss abandoning Ice Age for now, it was agreed to create another printing of the original set. Since the first was promised to be a limited edition, this was called Unlimited. It was intended to replace the black border with gray to distinguish them from the original, but that didn't work out, so they grudgingly went with white, which would be used to indicate a reprint set for many years. Unlimited was bigger than Alpha and Beta put together, 40 million cards printed, yet even that only managed to last from mid-January to mid-March. The audience was voracious, and it was quite clear that another set was called for to satisfy demand. While Garfield was working on Arabian Nights, Elias, the first to spot the overpowered nature of the Moxes, remember, began work on an artifact-focused set called Antiquities. Joining him in that endeavor was Jim Lynn, Dave Petty, and Chris Page, who were being referred to as the East Coast playtesters. Nearly every card in the set either was an artifact or interacted with artifacts in some way. Among them were two cards that played off of a little stopgap in the rules, the reason why Ancestral Recall has that alternate use. It was possible that a game could run so long that a player would exhaust all the cards in their library. And then what happens? With no more cards, there was nothing left to do except use what was in your hand, and thus could lead to stalemate. To avoid that, Garfield added a rule that if you had to draw a card and your library was empty, you immediately lost. Well, the Antiquities team decided to use that rule with a card called Millstone, which you could use over and over to have the opponent put two cards from their library into their graveyard, implied by the flavor text to be slowly driving the player mad from the sound of a grinding millstone. But to make sure that there was a solution if that became a problem, Felden's cane was added to the deck. It was supposed to be Felden's ice cone, but a typo led to the artist drawing a cane. Coming up with strategies and counter strategies also showed up with the lands. Brand new lands could tap for extra to play artifacts, or for extra if you had all three of Urza's out there, called Urzatron these days. And Mishra's factory could turn into a creature and attack, or defend, as needed. Because lands can't be countered, the team tried to counterbalance with a land that could itself destroy lands, called Strip Mine. This may have been something to do with Dave Petty, who during the original playtesting for Magic created a land destruction deck that made Garfield realize the power level of some of those cards. But what was most notable about Antiquities, besides the further explosion of the design space, was to give it a storyline. Limited was, even by those who loved it, admittedly rather a generic fantasy setting. And Arabian Nights had flavor, but mostly just by alluding to an existing work. Antiquities sought to tell a story through its card images and its flavor text. And the ad sounded like it should be read by Don LaFontaine. Long ago, when magic had no color, two wizards battled for control of Dominia. Now Antiquities unearths the relics of this ancient rivalry. Over 75 artifacts and spells for use with your Magic the Gathering deck. So, stash a few Antiquities in your Magic deck and unleash the power of the past. For those with their hackles raised, I did say Dominia. We'll get to that later on. It was the tale of two brothers whose names I mentioned, Urza 
and Mishra, and both were artificers. Their names were taken from the limited set, which had three artifacts in it called Ankh of Mishra, Glasses of Urza, and Sunglasses of Urza. They discovered the remnant of a civilization called the Thran, who perished in a war with the evil Phyrexians. But thanks to the Might Stone and Weak Stone that Urza and Mishra recovered, the two were able to kick off a fantasy industrial revolution for war against each other. Now remember what I said about the expansion hosing cards, like City in a Bottle, the one that shut down all the cards from that expansion so players could keep that out of their games? Well, the third one besides Homelands was in Antiquities, called Golgothian Silex, a kind of bowl. But this was a story, remember? So in this story, Urza used the Golgothian Silex that had been discovered and brought to him to bring a final end to the war creating the Silex Blast. It was so powerful that it triggered a sort of nuclear winter, thus setting the stage for the eventual arrival of the Ice Age. Antiquities was yet another hit, but the success wasn't just good for Wizards of the Coast. The timing of it was perfect for another business, or rather, for hundreds of other businesses, local comic book shops. As I've discussed at length elsewhere, Speculation and mismanagement at multiple levels led to a comic book bubble, and just as magic was starting to appear, it burst. A massive implosion followed, and the fallout was devastating. In the end, 90% of comic book shops across the United States closed their doors forever. But some store owners saw the writing on the wall, just as magic was starting to appear, and so a number of these store owners pivoted from comics or comics and collectibles, to also start carrying Magic the Gathering. As a result, it's been estimated that some 500 comic book shops that would have failed managed to keep their doors open thanks to the new influx of gamers. To help cater to them, these stores not only prominently displayed the product, but soon began buying and selling individual cards, called singles, the same way that they had with comics. This was a natural evolution. Many of these new gamers were already comic book fans, and comic shop owners had long known that their shops tended to also serve as a place for their customers to gather and discuss and debate their passions, turning their business into a hub of activity for all things comic related. Knowing this, these stores took the next logical step with this Magic the Gathering thing. Not only could you buy cards there, but they cleared away some space and set up tables and chairs so that gamers could play some Magic the Gathering right there in the store. After all, the more players played, the more they'd want to invest in the game. Making themselves a hub for gamers this way helped everybody. Wizards gained exposure and sold product, stores increased foot traffic and had an alternate revenue stream, and players could indulge in their game and develop a sense of community. Even comic book fans who weren't interested could at least appreciate that their source of comics was being kept in business thanks to the game. With the success of Magic and the dedicated space, many of these owners expanded further in the gaming direction, so that other games like those using Avalon Hill-style products or, or miniatures could make use of this space too. They became comic and gaming shops, or comic and collectible shops, or sometimes just hobby shops. This operated hand-in-hand hand with the growing interconnectivity of the blossoming internet. You had a global community that was being created around this product to discuss the implications of it and strategize and theorize and just generally revel in their passions. And yet also, thanks to the local game stores, or LGS for short, they were also building communities at the local level too. What perhaps best signaled just how far Magic the Gathering had come was how this little game launched in August to fill the niche role of something to kill time between events had become the event. By January, the Duelist Convocation, later adding International to their name and finally just shortening it to DCI, was formed in order to address the need for an organized tournament format. At 1993 Gen Con, it was that brand new game that was getting buzz. By 1994 Gen Con, 
their first world championship was held, with 512 slots all filled by excited players. Three years after that, Wizards of the Coast owned the convention. Literally. Gen Con was now their property. Five years later, Peter Adkinson, the guy who showed up in a rental van and was trying to track down his own product, took personal ownership of Gen Con and holds it to this day.